Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And today we're talking about Vampire of the Masquerade by White Wolf. We were going to talk about World of Darkness. The whole but there's thing. There's a lot of it. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack in those, all that World of Darkness stuff. But Vampire of the Masquerade, it's a uh, very uh, interesting and uh, storied history to that game because it's been around since 1991 and uh, has had many incarnations since then. And I thought it would be a good subject to cover for our podcast. We've kind of mentioned it every once in a while because it is had a big impact in uh, role-playing games, but we never really discussed it just by itself. It always in references to other things. So Vampire the Masquerade was published in 1991 by Stuart and uh, Steve. I don't know if I say their last name. The they, White Wolf Publishing people. Yeah, they formed White Wolf. I didn't know. Uh, I had to look it up. But uh, the game was actually kind of thought up by this other guy. What was his name? Uh, he, it was, it, he's given credit, dude. Oh, is he? I, I mean, I didn't know. That's because you didn't really like this system. His name is Mark Rain Hagen. Mark Rain Hagen, that's right. And interestingly enough, there's a whole uh, documentary, because when I was researching this, I'm all, Saul, there's a documentary. <laughs> we got to watch it. It's called World of Darkness something. Yeah. And World I'm, of Darkness, the documentary, or something like it, that. You can look it up, but it's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's, a little produ- it's produced pretty well. It, and it has a lot of information, which I didn't know. Like, I don't remember, but at some point... In the 90s, there was a television show. Yes, and <laughs> I a, never saw it. it was about- <laughs> <laughs> I never I never remember. It came on after a show I watched, and I didn't even know. Yeah, well, it was after The X-Files, supposedly, right? Yeah, and, and interestingly enough, that means that after The X-Files, I turned off the TV, and I didn't even <laughs> know there was another show on that I might have liked. You just immediately turned off the TV. There was no better show than X-Files at the time. Or I saw that it had vampires, and vampires aren't my favorite thing hunter thing so so vampire hits the streets in 1991 and it's totally different from other role-playing games in a certain sense right it does it does change what a role-playing is it emphasizes storytelling right and it calls the G- gm a storyteller and it and the book doesn't start off with stats or races and stuff it starts off with what a storyteller is and and how to run a storytelling game but it's still a role-playing game oh yeah and it it before we go into all the things that it changed and stuff and things it brought about i think it 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 was um the mechanics of it were kind of they there weren't classes there were clans right and but they did roll dice there were dice pools they got the in fact they the the creator um mark rain hagen he turned he he talked to or he got somebody to help him not help him that i did tom dowd the guy that did uh shadow run right one of the co-designers of shadow run so the system has dice pools but instead of six-sided dice they're ten-sided, ten-sided dice yeah i didn't ever realize that that connection i remember the dice pools and dice pools is shadow run is all about dice pools but what i liked when i remember playing i didn't play vampire i played werewolf and what I liked about it was that it was so simple, right? They they didn't have numbers. They had little dots. And the dots told you how many dice you had to combine your skill and your attribute to throw in your dice pool. And I thought it was very I thought it was very ingenious because there's no math, I guess. So when I was playing Werewolf much much later than nineteen ninety one, it was probably the, right around two thousand or late nineties. It was really interesting. I, I really liked it. I just thought, I, oh, I looked at the dots and just, I didn't have to count numbers. I didn't have to do anything. I just, it was very easy and it wasn't intrusive, which I guess is what World of Darkness games are. It allows you to be more of a game about talking to each other and stuff like that than killing stuff and taking their stuff, killing pe- things and taking their stuff. Because as a vampire, you don't need to do that. You have Usually, you don't have to. You're not in the game of trying to enrich or get richer in the game. So you eliminate that. It changes what the games are about, which I thought were pretty interesting. Yeah, instead of having to make a certain role to see if you make it. Well, you do make the role, but it's like just a number that you're trying to 
A target number. Target number. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I just thought it was very interesting. I go, wow, there's no, there's no numbers on the character sheet. They're just dots. And that just tells you what you need to, how many dice you need to roll. Uh, another thing I liked about the game is that, that because you, this is not a game about murder hoboing, right? They're not killing things and taking their treasure. You're just killing them. There's different stories to tell. Well, well, what other stories are to tell? And that, and that pushes you to come up with other things that would, that would make the game go right to make that, that to change the type of adventures that you're going to run. It changes a lot of things, right? Uh, in that sense. So well, I'm going game- to say that it's probably about political intrigue. Within right. The- exactly. What I was going to say, I was going to say intrigue. I didn't think about political intrigue, but that's exactly what it is. I mean, political intrigue within the clan, within the clans and, within and power structures and stuff like that. So, and that's what, the game is about so how do you role play that is by interacting with each other and scheming and making plans and making uh what is it alliances with with other vampires and and this and behind all that is this idea that you don't want to get caught right you don't want to be exposed as vampires because vampires in the game are like hidden right they don't want to be exposed that's what it's called the masquerade because they're masquerading as humans in certain senses sometimes but they don't want exposure so there's that there's that thing over overlying everything overlying over everything in the sense that overlaying overlaying over overlaying the game that there's all kinds of things you want to do but at the but you can't be out in the open Overt, yeah. Overt, right. So which really makes it like this kind of a sneaky, you got to be undercover and you got, it's just a really different experience than other role playing games. Up until that I time. don't know that up, up until that up time. Up until that time. So the, the guys that made this, the both the brothers for White Wolf Publishing and uh, and Mark Rain Hagen, they grew up playing D&D. Right. And other role playing games. And they, they actually met at Gen Con and... Okay, yes, right. It was interesting listening to them talk about, you know, their childhoods and stuff like they were all they all consider themselves the outsiders. Right. They all consider themselves, you know, not one the in fact uh, Mark Rain Hagen said he he never fit in, nobody ever liked him. And I thought that was I'm like, yeah, that's like what people typically say about you know, they find role playing and they find that kind of community where they fit in with people. Right, right. So vampire it really got the the what do you want to call it? It piqued the interest of people that were like goths and and uh, kids that were experiencing angst at the time, right? I think so. I mean, I remember it coming out. One, I know I'm kind of a scaredy cat, and I've talked about that before. And it was just wasn't my kind of game when it came out. I was like, eh, you know, I don't want to play a vampire. I don't understand. I didn't understand what you could do right i wasn't i was playing D and perfectly happy playing D D. so the idea of playing a monster was like well uh, what do you do and and then i never got it and then the people who played it were very you know they would wear makeup and stuff like that and uh it just wasn't my uh conservative role-playing mindset fun in my mind but for other people obviously it was a outlet that they needed because it does, you know, D and D already uh, role playing games already attracts outsiders and stuff like that during this time, right? The seventies and the eighties, and even in the nineties. So, well, even today, even today, but today, Although today it's, it's more slightly changed yeah. for the better, right? And so, what happens is when we when we look at the people who were playing, they were very more, much more interested in telling stories, right, and telling. Uh, Stories other than than treasure hunting and stuff. Well, we've talked about it before. Um, they were the. It was like it was a sort of therapy for them. What they didn't, they may not have realized it at the time. Right. But one of the people on that documentary was taught was talking about how it was very therapeutic to be able to actually meet people like yourself who have the same experience and. One, they really liked who the the guy that they hired to do the the. Do you remember his name? The one that did the the drawings, the art. I forget uh, his name, but um, he did it very um, you know, club like. 
and they were all living in Atlanta at the time in the 80s and the club scene you know there were punks punk punk rock was a thing and there were a lot of people into that kind of stuff yeah definitely I think uh well for me in 1991 I was still in college in Chico so it wasn't a a bed of a a bed of role playing, at least not that I could remember. And then I well, actually graduated in 1991, so I was home in Salinas in 19 right after this game hit. Uh, Salinas isn't the hotbed of uh, liberalness. And what was funny is that the people that I, I saw that it attracted were people who were really into like uh, drama. They were theater people, people who were actually like in theater in high school and in college, and. <clears throat> I think because of all kinds of factors, right? There's all kinds of movies that came out in the early 80s. Anne Rice was a big deal in the early 80s. Although um, the the guy that that wrote it, um, Mark Rainhagen, he said that he refused to read oh, Anne yes. Rice because he didn't want it, his world to be tainted. And <laughs> which was, he goes, which was hilarious because all the stuff that he was that he referencing. was referencing like he lost boys and and um some of the other ones he was like he discovered later that that was totally Anne rice right like they were they were <laughs> developed with those ideas right they had read Anne rice yeah right? and so that's what all those themes and and political and political stuff all, was, all the kind of stuff in was coming from Anne rice novels i don't know when not was, only Anne rice novels right. but some of them and, right and i i don't even know when Anne rice was was published, but I know when I was in college in 1988, so it was before, yeah, obviously before uh, uh, the Lost Boys and stuff. This guy did a, a reading of a passage of an interview with a vampire, and I had no idea what he was talking about. So he goes, Hey, do you want to listen to me do my thing? And I go, Sure. And it, I forget what he was into, I guess he was in drama, but he was, it was, this was like a spoken type of word where you talk uh, as the character who's saying these words. So he starts going into this spiel about that he is the vampire Lestat and stuff like that. I'm like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And he was talking, you know, he was in character. So I'm like, and then I'm like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. But it was really interesting. What was funny is actually uh, being that I was in Chico at the time and I was dressed for Selena's weather. I had a lot of sweaters and stuff. And so when, when I went to Chico and I became friends with this guy, well, he was a dorm mate. You know, he lived in my dorm floor and he's asking people, he's a bigger guy. So he's asking people for sweaters and nobody has a sweater. And he goes, Hey, do you have a sweater? I go, yeah, what do you want a sweater for? It's freaking hundred degrees. And, he, and I go, I he goes, do you have a black sweater? I go, yeah. So I lent him my black sweater cause he needed to wear, you know, that was part of the character cause you know, vampires were black, I guess. And I was just, it was, it was interesting, but I just, I never equated it, you know, Anne Rice with this, you know, this vampire Lestat thing until, until the movies came out. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, that's what he was doing. <laughs> Obviously I knew that he was doing some story, but I didn't know, I didn't know it was Anne Rice. So I thought it was interesting. So that was, you know, it was kind of famous in 88. So she must've been writing in the early eighties and mid eighties. And he was a drama guy, right? So that, you know, that totally, he could have been playing Vampire Masquerade later on easily. I just want to tell you that in Chico, there were people playing role-playing games. You just didn't know where they were. <laughs> okay, that's true. No, I knew some people who would play, but I didn't, I won. I didn't, I wasn't like. You I didn't want to be outed as a, as as a, a role Yeah, player. there's that. And I was really busy. I was, I took, I was trying to take uh, going to school seriously. So I was pretty busy most of the time unlike most of my uh my dorm mates and even my my roommates at the time later on but it was very interesting i thought it was uh he it was it was very interesting this this it was like a, a speech that he was giving right this vampire i could see people who were really into drama really liking vampire the game the masquerade game because it was moody it was like you said what what was another one it was uh, angsty there's a lot of angsty people in the in the early '90s and mid '90s. Well, <laughs> I thought it was interesting in that documentary that we were watching. One guy said that he was working in a in a role playing store or, or a gaming store, and all of a sudden, after Masquerade came out, all of these people, these gothic people dressed 
in gothic style. Black or, clothes yeah, and white makeup. Came in and they would buy Ma- Vampire the Masquerade and they wouldn't talk to anybody else in the store and they would leave. <laughs> and he goes, it was very, it was totally different than most role play guys at the time. You know, they will tuck your ear off and right. if, if someone was And talk, women. Uh, yeah. Yes. Wow. I think when you have that group of people who are considering themselves outsiders, just like regular D&D players, and then they find a game where they can be like with other people they like, and it, and they're doing stuff that for them is fun, right? Which is playing in this character, in this moody world, this dark world. And and because it so easily plays into this idea of, of, of going into LARPs, it was a huge uh, LARP game. I mean, it still is. I'm sure. Right, and I remember that was one of the first LARP games that I ever heard of was Masquerade because they actually came out with a rule set for for Masquerade Vampire Masquerade called it was the company was called Mind's Eye or some of like that uh, live action role playing the mask vampire. And it was I'm in not- a box. It was because I, I remember seeing it because you had bought me. Um, there was you had bought me those those um, what were they called? How, how to host a murder at home? Oh, yes, two yes, of them. Yes, and we had gone to David um, or Dee Dee had had uh, had one at his house. Oh, you didn't go to I didn't it. Go to it. Me and your brothers and Alicia went. Right, right. And so it was a, it was, and we were vampires there. That was a very. I I wonder if it. I don't know what one it was, but it was very interesting. It was supposed to be a LARP, but we were. It was us, so we were just sitting around the living room talking, right? And yeah, talking yeah, yeah. To each other. yeah, yeah. We got better at it as as we went. As the night went on. As Unfortunately, to... Alicia was the was the queen vampire. And, you were actually playing vampires. Well, at least she was. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and um, and my my sister uh, in law was very quiet. She's very shy. And very she shy. doesn't want to talk to people. Yes. And so nobody could figure out who the killer was cuz she, she wouldn't talk to anybody. Them. Which, you know, if you're a killer, you wouldn't want to talk about which stuff. Which Didi should have known, but you know, there you go. I think he was trying to pull her out of her shell. Yes, which was and, and, and as Felipe that's one that's turtle. a mistake. That's the turtle that's not going to come out of its shell. But she's ha- she had fun. It was just that she wasn't into the whole she, you know, you would ask her a question. She'd tell you stuff, right? Right. From her sheet, but she wouldn't. Role she play wouldn't it role play it, right? And she wouldn't give away that she was the killer either, because <laughs> that's funny. I remember that. I remember you guys telling me that, and I must have been working because I don't remember. Robert, but... Robert, your brother Robert had fun. Right. That was his first first foray into foray role-playing. into a... <laughs> role playing. It was a LARP. I, that was that was in Salinas. Yes, right? it was. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to play that game, and I, th- I probably would, I might, would have enjoyed it. It would have been interesting. But I, le- I always love people that play LARPs. They, they love to dress up, and, and Saul is always, when we go to conventions, every once in a while, he go, oh, there go the LARPers. But then right. I, go, I look at him, and I go, dude, you love Halloween. You, your whole family goes to, out to the nines and dressing up and making sure that their costumes are cool. And when we go to the Renaissance Fair, hello, you dress up and... And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he always gets this. He has this love hate kind of thing with the whole idea. <laughs> I used to have a love hate. Not so much hate no more. No. But you're right. I was. I think he was just. He's just envious because they have cool costumes. I think there was a little bit of that, mm-hmm. right? And I wasn't. What is it? I wasn't confident enough to go and dress up and be a vampire somewhere. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it takes a like there was uh, talking about that. <laughs> documentary the documentary about that that one woman who was uh she was having her her mom was sick and so she was going to uh she was going to go to this thing and she dressed up and she she, she kind of showed up and she was intimidated by these people and she left the room right and then they kind of like they kind of slowly coaxed her into they come out and talk to her then they'd go back to the room and they go oh, come back to the i guess they were in a large room yeah and then she would say no and then after a while, they finally she finally like okay, this is okay. I'm I feel okay about it, and it's because some of them followed her out of the room and tried to make her feel comfortable, right? Right, right. No, no, and that's good, and that's that's what you want. Uh, that's a very positive experience in in an LARP, and so. And I think that's you know, that's one of the things that's attractive about 
role playing in general yes. is that people want you to feel comfortable, although you hear horror stories about about it. But there's a lot of horror stories out there. <clears throat> but I think that would be that was really cool. That, right. I was I was pretty uh, impressed in the fact that they you know they knew that she was having uh, issues as far as uh, how comfortable she was with the situation and and they handled it obviously they handled it very well. She started playing and is now a devoted player. And another thing is I found interesting is that, uh, and I didn't know was through that uh, documentary was there was like this huge fan base, fan base. Uh, uh, and they were meeting all over the place in all the, over all the world. world. And it was, and in large numbers, right. They would go to clubs even and be playing and, and listening to music and be playing at the same time in this, world which sounds it. absolutely cool to me <laughs> I, I wish that Saul would have been more adventurous in our in our role in the you know kind of role-playing games that we did i'm not i don't i'm i don't know i, if, I don't know if that was here though i don't know if san jose <laughs> was in the bet, hotbed of that kind of activity maybe san francisco uh something that uh, were i hate to use the term weird but you know that where weirdness isn't uh i, I don't think you should use that term we're not weird i don't think they're weird no but but uh it's a, it takes a sp- a different kind of community to to be able to those communities are all over the place i still i remember in, okay. in chico um sarah took me to that movie that you don't like where everybody goes at night and watches it the one with the Rocky talking Horror plant yes. yes and there were people dressed up for that yes. and so i was like you went to what i go well she wanted to go so i went and there were a bunch of very interesting people that i met I, I, you know what but that there was i don't think there was a midnight showing of rocky Horror picture show in salinas i think what influenced chico because it's chico is a very small town was a very small town even when i went it was only like six or seventy thousand not I would think you don't think it was quite that big. Not okay, so it was even smaller, but it had a college, and colleges tends to bring in a lot of different people from different places, which is isn't inherent from that community. You know, so what I'm saying is that mm-hmm. people in Chico who lived in Chico and were from Chico were from a very conservative community. Same thing with Salinas, yeah. And there wasn't this influx of other people from all over the place who were like not right part of that culture and part of that society. And so it was a good mix of people. And I think anywhere there's a college, maybe even San Jose, there's going to be uh, there's going to be that kind of mixture of people. And that's going to make it so when things like that can happen, like like they were talking about Atlanta. Was it Atlanta? Atlanta. Yeah, that's where they, they lived. And they were in a certain area of Atlanta that was really into like in the, I don't know what you'd call it, but they were very like it was, they were artsy. Artsy, it was, that's and, right. And artsy and they were like because i saw there was like tattoo parlors and, and there were independent clubs record stores and all kinds of different things actual yeah. record stores and and stuff like that and so and there's even in portland i remember, i know some people who live in portland who started a, a macabre store right where they're selling just i guess use the term weird stuff but or strange stuff how's that and so <clears throat> they're play, they're running this business and then they got the rent increased Actually, no. What happened was people were complaining about the store being kind of too strange. So they said that they weren't going to re- redo their lease. And so they were forced to close down, which I thought was kind of sad. But 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 those places do exist in certain cities. And I think usually the bigger the city, there's going to be a, a section of town where it's it's more of an artsy, bohemian place, right? Yeah. I mean, there's artsy people everywhere, but some of them aren't. As overtly artsy, I guess. And then some, you know, sometimes they congregate in certain sections of towns, yeah. right? And I guess in Atlanta, that's where this, uh, that's where they were at. This uh, White Wolf ended up being there. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. It's a very interesting group of uh, of how they came to be. What I also was interested in, I remember seeing this this uh, role playing game called Nightlife way back, and I'm like, and I, and I looked up to see when it came out. It actually came out before. Vampire of the Masquerade, and it actually has a lot of the same stuff in it that that va- that Vampire Masquerade had in it. It had they had sort of clans, and they had they were uh, they were they were very secretive and stuff like that. And it was very interesting. Was it about vampires? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It was vamp- all monsters included like werewolves and stuff, but mainly it was it was vampires because it, it mainly focused on vampires. And uh, sadly, later on, 
White Wolf had the same problem, right? They had Vampire the Masquerade. There was all these movies that came out after. Right? Yeah. And and one the first one like was Blade. Blade. Blade, right? And one of the, and the artist, I forget his uh, what was his name? I, geez, I forgot his name, but he has a very interesting name. You can look it up, right? And he said at one point when Blade did, there's this and they showed it on this video. He does this maneuver, and he goes, "That's that's my guy. That's my drawing, right?" So then I, at one point. He was talking to someone who worked on the movie. Yes. And then and he says, well, yeah, we had your art book. At, open. Open. And he goes, oh, you didn't bother to, to he goes, hire yeah. me to help <laughs> you with this? So then what's funny is that later on he gets a call by, ben, uh, not Benicio del Toro, but the, G- Guillermo. Guillermo del Toro, the director, maybe the producer. Director for, for the second movie. For the second Blade yeah. or Blade 2. And he goes, I'll hire you. I'll pay Blade. you this time. I'll for pay your... you this time for your work. I thought was a pretty cool story. Kudos to them to finally coming up, going to the original art, artist and saying, yeah, we owe you one, right? Uh, but later on, I remember years later, I was watching, uh, my brother had this, I don't know where he got it, but he had this like this kit, like a, like a movie production kit or something like that, or something that they sent to fans or something like you write in, oh, I, I want an interest in this movie. And the, and the movie was called Underworld. Oh, yeah. And he had like a map. Like a map of the of like this in, on parchment, and he had this. Uh, I think he had like a coin, like a coin that said uh, that said Underworld, and it was very and and he had all this stuff, and I'm like, and I'm and then ha- of course it had all kinds of stuff. Uh, what is it? Uh, it had all kinds of background on the movie or in the movie world, and it's talking about vampires and this war between vampires and and werewolves, and I'm like, what the? Heck? I go, is this about a role playing? I didn't know it was that. It didn't say movie. Nowhere did it say movie. I guess somewhere if I read this small print, it would have said like, you know, 20th century pictures. But but I was like, man, is this a movie? And it looked, sounded really interesting where you play vampire. Or not you play, but it's a, talking about vampires and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the lichen wars, right? And I'm like, man, what is this? And then this was a quite a bit before the movie came out. Because then, then Underworld came out in the movie. And I was, holy crap, this is... Uh, this is Vampire the Masquerade, kind of, right? It was a lot of themes. A you know, lot of they, people thought that. Right. And it was like from way back, you know, the, the vampires have been around for a long time. They were hiding from general population. Uh, I never, knew, I didn't think about the, the, the werewolf aspect. I don't remember that from Vampire Masquerade, but I know they had already came or out with werewolf. werewolf. Yeah. And it turns out that no, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't tied to uh, White Wolf. World of Darkness, or or had anything to do. With but since they stole their entire idea, <laughs> they did get sued for it. They did get sued, right? And they actually had, and they settled, and they settled, and they were able to make uh, one the rest of the movies. I thought it was interesting. It's hard to come up with something in a total vacuum, right? So when I was reading Nightlife, the 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 that other vampire game. There was a lot of similarities. It was a percentile system. It was actually numbers. It was that was, and it still had like a lot of uh, a lot of attributes. But there was a lot of stuff that was in it that pretty much was in Masquer- Vampire Masquerade. Did it come out before or after? Nineteen ninety. It came out before. Oh, so before. Yeah, and then the second edition came out in nineteen ninety two, and uh, like I said, and then uh, of course, but for whatever reason. Uh, Nightlife was a very small company, independent publisher. Uh, didn't didn't blossom like uh, like White Wolf did. Not like White Wolf, uh, the artist was very good, right? Mm-hmm. He, and then he he they were using whole page panels of the of his art, and it really like what is it? it the art really popped. Popped as as one word, but not one that was used. <laughs> not the one I used, but it was very evocative. Of the genre, right? Of the, that he, they were trying to portray this. They call it gothic punk. Yes, right. Which I, I had never heard of, and it was very modern. They weren't these. Uh, what is it? They weren't these. It wasn't comic bookish, or and right. It wasn't what do you want to call it? Like childish art, or right? Or it wasn't like fantasy art either. It right. Was, it wasn't line art. Yeah. It was a lot of there was a lot of ink, you know, a lot of black and shades and stuff like that. I thought it was very good art. Again. And art is really makes the makes the role playing book more interesting, right? right. It really is, and and now 
people put a lot of money into getting yes, artists yes. to do that. Well, and what's what's funny is that when you look at the art, it can it can make or break a game, a role playing game. Even back then, because uh, like er, like the they actually talked to the author in the documentary. He said that he wasn't knocking it, but a lot of the previous art was line art, right? It was this like very traditional type of art and when he when he did the masquerade they told him what they were going after he goes oh yeah yeah i could do that they looked at his art they go that's perfect that fits what we're trying to the mood we're trying yeah. to evoke and i think it's true because if you look at that art they you know it's not like these uh what is it these uh kings of vampires dressed in like uh 18th century or 17th century 16th century clothes there were these very street looking like people with with long coats and sunglasses. Well, considering that he used his friends who were in <laughs> bands, right. and they were like you know musician types, musicians in the in the in late nineties, uh, no early nineties. I mean er, early, late late eighties, early nineties. Yes, yes, and then of course there were a bunch of punks. Right? Yeah, there were a bunch of punks, and so you know they have these uh, these like jackets with studs on yeah. them, and they're torn and stuff like that. It was really cool. I mean, I remember looking at the book, and I'm like, wow, this this guy's a pretty good artist. I remember when um, in Chico, when because that's where I grew up for my teenage years. I remember when um, when punk really came out, and some of the college students, you know, they came and they they were dressed like you know in black yeah and they had spikes on their coats and stuff and i remember that it caused a big stir stir be, stir stir because people were like what the is going on <laughs> okay that never happened in salinas <laughs> <laughs> it was like, <laughs> no i remember there was, there was a couple people who were into especially the people that put you know eyeliner the guys oh, that yeah. put eyeliner and had black lipstick some people just didn't know how to handle that oh, yeah. i thought it was pretty cool <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that didn't happen in Salinas. Uh, the closest was this one guy called Aaron, and he was really into like uh, Billy Idol mm -hmm. and and punk, punk yeah, uh, and other stuff. And he, and I think he was he was a little ahead of the of the wave, at least for Salinas. Well, everybody he, is ahead of the wave he, for Salinas. <laughs> and he pierced the the skin oh, between dude. his between his uh, thumb and finger, thumb and finger, that little flap of skin here, and he pierced it. Right, I'm like, I thought he was freaking crazy. <laughs> And he was because it got infected. He had to take it out, right? Because, you know, I don't know he how. He did it himself. Yeah. Or he had his friend do it. Well, I think he did it himself. And then, uh, so that was my first, and that was in 1983, 84. So that was kind of early. But but anyway, it was, Salinas wasn't a, a real high punk scene. When people say how 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 California is, they don't, they don't realize that California is full of small towns. <laughs> that are Full of small towns. Yes. <laughs> that are not the same as other places. They're not, they're not the they're avocado, not date. avocado toast eating people. Yeah. No. No, yeah, we do love avocados. Yes. yes that's true. But, but we uh, make it into guacamole. So. <laughs> Especially in Salinas. So I never had that experience. I, I never saw anybody dressed like that in Salinas. I don't think. Not that I can remember. Do you ever see, remember seeing anybody? No. But I remember, well, because I remember it because this they came to our church and oh were, wow um which was a assemblies of god church and they were from out of town and they were actually assemblies of god people they were just you know they were they had been they were from somewhere else and i remember that the, <laughs> all the teenage girls were like oh wow and all of the the older guy older men in the church were like uh-uh this isn't what we're <laughs> I just remember it was a wow. very interesting, it was a very interesting couple of weeks. I can't even imagine, <laughs> especially you know, one you're in a conservative town, two you got a very conservative church, so you know you're not toying, very you're not toying the line when you're dressed yeah. like that. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting. The conclusion was we accept all people because you know that's what you convert to. them to. To, to, to. to wear normal clothes? <laughs> that, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you don't have them in the fold, you can't influence them. Well, that's true. So I think when you look at the Masquerade, the Vampire Masquerade, I think it was very, it was a huge uh, hit, right? Yeah. It, and, it, it, and it also, it, you, could, you could say that it helped to, to evolve role playing. Right. Definitely. Definitely. It was the first game that really emphasized storytelling stories instead of combat right? yeah because you know vampires are very strong 
They, nothing's usually uh, going to mess with them except the other vampires. Right. And they're pretty hard to kill, so you got to really plan it out yeah. if you're going to yeah. kill one. You have to be very quick, too, because they're fast. <laughs> very quick. Okay, I, like, I always quick. think of, when I, when, I, I always, when I think of vampires, I always think of Dresden, right? And Oh, uh, Dresden Files. Dresden yeah. Files. And I always think of how whenever we, we play that game, the, the fate, is it fate that it uses or its own system? Or do you it's just fate. use it? Yeah. Fate. Well, when we play it, all the people at the table have this consensus. If you run into a vampire, you just need to walk away because they're going to kill you. Yeah. They're just so powerful. You don't want to get into a fight with them. So whenever that's what you think about. So a room full of vampires. Right. Or a house that, full. It becomes a political intrigue thing of, of who's vying for power because they're just as they're thinking the same thing. Right. They're both so strong that they can kill each other. Right. Right. Yeah. When, and you know, start a war. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know if, if anybody who's read the Dresden Files, he does have clans, the red clan. They're based on colors, though, right? Yeah. And the color, is, they're, they're actually physically different. I think the black ones are more, are more like bat like and, and look like big, huge bat, ugly things. And then uh, there's white vampires and red vampires, and then they, they're called courts and stuff. So when I ran, when I ran the, the Dresden Files game, I actually had a vampire in the game. And in the game, they're not as powerful as they are in the books. But people had read the books and some people had not read the books. So when they came in and like when I mentioned the vampire, so some players had read the books and they knew how powerful vampires were. And then I think all the players had, or no, maybe not all of them. Was this with, with your test group of us or was this with your this actual was, this at, was a, at, a at a convention? convention. Yeah. yeah. And then. And other people had not. So when somebody mentioned, when I mentioned vampires, like half the group goes, we oh, don't want to mess with them, yeah. right? And then the <laughs> other half, half is going, like, we can take them. <laughs> not that we can take them, but they, they weren't as afraid. I think it was very interesting. Well, see, that's the thing about books and, and, and vampire, the masquerade. I think that is also a thing. People who read Anne Rice or Dracula, and they've seen the, the movies like Lost Boys and all of, all of the things, when vampire the masquerade came out people had an idea of oh, yeah. what a vampire is right. right and a lot of it is you know they live for so long they they have these moral dilemmas are they going to kill all the people in the town or are they going to go for cows or what are they you know what's the what is the how are they going to feed what are they going to do and how are they going to keep their place right right and i think that's what ultimately the game was more about what it is to be human the which, choices that you're gonna and the make. choices that you make as a character and i think that's that's vastly different than, let's say, a D and D game where it's not a really. You can make it about your humanity and the moral choices you make, but a lot of it has to do with monster hunting, which is very different from a vampire game. The, the what the themes, underlying themes of what almost every adventure is going to be, or every session is going to be about. It's not going to be about. You're not going to go somewhere and kill monsters and and gain treasure and gain levels and experience and get more powerful. You're more making alliances and breaking alliances and you back. have goals but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the goals of everybody else right in the room, right and you got certain things that you want to achieve the rules is, is that there's a humanity score somewhere in the yeah in the game and is if you lose humanity there's a point where you just become a beast a, this murdering beast that just goes around and killing everything and eating everything so that's what you want to not happen theoretically I think it's a very interesting game. I mean, I, I like I said, I was never interested in playing a vampire. I, I never looked at it too deeply other than you're playing a vampire. And I don't understand why you would want to do, play that game. Later on, like I said, much later, I played a session of Werewolf by uh, this guy called David at DungeonCon. It was me and Felipe. And I really had a, I had a really fun time. We made, a vamp we made werewolves. And it was not unlike any other game. And a lot of them were people that he already played with but he just wanted a large a slightly large group i think there was maybe six of us and it was fun it was fun it was interesting but there was a lot of stuff like even in werewolf there was there have i don't know if they have clans but they're they're broken up into groups and they're like oh you guys are a certain group gurus or something like that and like there was all kinds of stuff that the, that meant they were talking about that in that documentary we were watching that world of darkness they especially vampire the masquerade but also werewolf so many books were published right. that the history that people that were new to the game would be 
overwhelmed by all the history, right? Right. Yes. That does happen. And you have... Uh, That's what happens when you build a world, right? Right. And it, it happens a lot in older systems that have a lot of history. Like I said, when I played the werewolf, there was people who had played and they knew all kinds of stuff. Like, they knew more about my clan than I knew, They're like, obviously, and they knew what it meant to be part of that clan, which I really didn't mean. I didn't know, I mean, mean, I didn't know, like, what, how that clan fit with the other clans, right? right? What that meant. What their, what right? their what their deal was uh, sort of where they did. And they're like, Oh, they were, uh, and I could tell by their voice that, and by their actions, reactions, they thought something really interesting about it. And I was clueless about it, but you know, so, so I, I think uh, they did produce a lot of books. And so when you have that much source background material. or source material, it can be intimidating to new players. I don't know what other game could, it's like star Wars, right? If you don't, Depending on how the you play the well, game, you, you, you can play. just say it's it's like the the worlds in D and D, right? Like Forgotten Realms yes. and and the other ones, they all have their specific histories and their right. specific ideas. And some people are like really into that source source material, and that's the world they want to be right. in, and and they know all the lore and the gods and everything. In fact, the kids were asking me something about which gods are we using in Pathfinder, and I'm like, I don't know, because when I'm not running the game, and two, I don't even know who the gods in Pathfinder are. <laughs> well, he was using uh, Forgotten Realms, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, he he based his Pathfinder game in Forgotten Realms. And it was funny because at one point my, my son didn't know that Pathfinder had its own world. I go, yeah. Because Saul just used Forgotten Realms. No, no, I was using Gal- Galarian, but oh, it was so you? similar, right? And that, well, I wasn't really doing a lot of info dumping yeah. about the world. So he just thought it was Forgotten Realms because you know, he was little when yeah. he started playing yeah first edition and by the time we uh went to fifth edition i just started in in forgotten realms he couldn't tell the difference because i wasn't really uh world building that gives it like you know the, the in this part of the world people dress like this and they speak in this manner i wasn't doing any of that it was all this homogeneous world yeah other than it was like distant. star trek with a universal translator <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> And then everybody looks the same, you know, yeah. just, even though they're not supposed to. Yeah. You know, this, uh, I don't know what you'd call them. But I think uh, there's been all kinds of incarnations of Vampire. I think they're on their fifth edition. Just published. They did have a hiccup with this game called uh, uh, Vampire Requiem. Yeah, nobody, none of their, <laughs> none of their people liked it. And it, it bombed, basically. It, you know, it had a huge, It had huge sales. Right. Because everybody bought it. Right. But they never bought anything else. Right. After and it. So then, after that stuff went down to the point where I don't even know if they acknowledge Requiem as part of their lore. I think they, I don't know. Yeah. I, anyway, so the fifth edition has come out. I think it's being published. I don't remember who publishes it. They uh, did. They Paradox. Did, Paradox. Although I think the actual publisher was Modifius. It was Modifius. But now, and they now got a new Paradox announced that Renegade, Renegade Game Studios, Studios would be publishing. The entire World of Darkness brand, and they would release Vampire the Masquerade products. So, because Vampire the Masquerade is one of those games that you, they made it some kind of deal with um, Drive Through RPG, and they right. they were releasing everything as um, a PDF. Right, you could get anything as a PDF. PDF and print and print and, on demand. Uh, what do you call print on demand? Right. And now they're actually going to go back to books. So or actually, being yeah, published. I think Modifius stuff. did publish actual books. Yes. But. Yeah, it's, it's a strange world now because. Uh, PDF because drive through RPG has really changed the way a lot of smaller companies can put their product out. And uh, because uh, Vampire Masquerade and World of Darkness stuff, there was a lot of stuff and it just, it just cost too much to print it. Right. Right. And to, too much money to print. And then hopefully it'll sell uh, this really old product and drive through RPG is, the only people buying it are people who, who want it. Who want it, right? And they're they're buying it, and pr- if they want to print, they'll print, and they'll obviously they'll get some money. And uh, uh, now I don't know the logistics or the numbers of how much money you get from a print on demand book compared to something you publish. But when you publish something, you usually have to have like you just can't publish ten. No, no, you, you got to publish, publish a lot, or yeah. a thousand books. Yeah. And any of those books that don't get sold, you're stuck with. Yeah. And that's money that's out of your pocket. So uh, it's interesting that they decided to take that back. They're, they're going back into publishing books. I think 
The only problems with drive through RPG are some people complain about the, the paper, the, the, the bindings and stuff like that. I've never had any problems with their books, but other people are, are maybe had a bit, different experience. Vampire the Masquerade is still around. It looks like it's going to keep on being supported by the new publisher. And even though I've never played it, I think it's a fascinating and it has an important important place in the history of RPGs. And it has had a huge influence, right? It, obviously, they've made movies off of it. And they were talking about, in that, in that one uh, documentary we saw, they talked about the true blood, where they're actually talking about how, the, how vampires were made. And it's verbatim from what that guy wrote in his first Masquerade book. A guy Kane. called Kane is the pregenerator of all vampires and stuff. And I thought, I'm like, wow. <laughs> this is, I don't know if you can sue him, but it's so... I mean, how can you sue something that's... Well, you took that out of the Bible, so it's like... Yeah. But not that he's the pregenerator of all vampires, but... Cain and Abel? Yeah. No, but that Cain is the maker of all vampires. I don't think that's... That's because he killed his brother. I know, no, but... <laughs> now, I know that, but I don't know. There's it's nothing not in the Bible, in the Bible yeah. that says that. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. If you play this game, obviously you know how... Uh, how different it is from D&D and you know the impact that it had on RPGs on a whole because it's really changed. Look at now, a lot of games are more about storytelling than uh, tactical moving uh, miniatures on a on a grid. So that's pretty cool. I mean, we just played Feng Shui, which had no maps and no grid. The only grid is the is the shot clock. <laughs> the, right, right. You got anything else to add, honey? No, I think if you if you like vampires and then Vampire the Masquerade is a cool game to play. Right. So there you go. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. You have a good day.